Hello guys, this is Indian Medico and in this video, we are going to see about Hypertensive Disorders of Pregnancy. This is a concise presentation for medical students. Hypertension in pregnancy is defined as blood pressure greater than or equal to 140 by 90 mm of mercury on two occasions at least 6 hours apart or diastolic blood pressure greater than 110 mm of mercury on a single occasion or an increase in diastolic blood pressure of 20 mm of mercury or more above booking or an increase in systolic blood pressure of 30 mm of mercury or more above booking. Chronic hypertension is hypertension diagnosed before pregnancy or in the first trimester. Essential hypertension is hypertension diagnosed before pregnancy or in the first trimester not secondary to another cause. Pregnancy induced hypertension is hypertension diagnosed after 20 weeks gestation. The two important definitions to remember are hypertension in pregnancy is defined as systolic blood pressure greater than or equal to 140 mm of mercury and diastolic blood pressure greater than or equal to 90 mm of mercury on two occasions at least six hours apart and the definition of pregnancy induced hypertension is hypertension diagnosed after 20 weeks gestation. Now let us see about preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is a pregnancy specific multi-system disorder. The classic definition of preeclampsia involved hypertension, proteinuria and edema. Earlier all these three should be present to diagnose preeclampsia. The current diagnosis is based on intrauterine growth restriction, hematological abnormalities, biochemical abnormalities and clinical symptoms or signs. If any of these are present, you can label the patient as a preeclamptic patient. Now let us see about the etiology of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. Chronic hypertension can occur due to endocrine disorders like Cushing syndrome and Kahn syndrome. It can occur secondary to renal disease or cardiac disease. Now let us see about the etiology of preeclampsia. The etiology of preeclampsia is poorly understood. The risk factors include genetic component. A strong family history might lead to preeclampsia in the current pregnancy, primary parity, multiple pregnancy, obesity, extremes of age, new partner, diabetes, chronic hypertension, antiphospholipid syndrome, renal disease and molar pregnancy. All these are risk factors for preeclampsia. Uterine artery Doppler studies can be done at 20 to 24 weeks to identify women at risk of preeclampsia. It reveals eye resistance and notched waveform in those women at risk of preeclampsia. Let us see about the pathophysiology of preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is due to abnormal placental trophoblast invasion in early pregnancy. Normally, there will be low resistance and high flow in spiral arteries of uterus. This does not occur in preeclampsia and it will lead to diffuse maternal vascular endothelial dysfunction. It will also cause vasoconstriction and platelet aggregation. Now let us see about the presentation of a case of preeclampsia. The women will give history of hypertension, headache or visual disturbance, epigastric pain, nausea and vomiting. She will also complain of edema of face and fingers. Now let us see about the examination of a case of preeclampsia. Blood pressure should ideally be measured at 45 degrees and an appropriate sized cuff should be used. Edema should be examined especially in legs, hands and face. Reflexes should be examined in preeclampsia. There can be hyperreflexia and clonus due to cerebral irritability. Abdomen should be examined for epigastric tenderness. Symphysial fundal light should be measured and liquor volume should be assessed. Let us see about the investigations done for a case of preeclampsia. Urine analysis should be done. If proteinuria is detected, 24 hour urine collection should be done. The criteria for preeclampsia is greater than 0.3 gram of protein per 24 hours. Complete blood count should be done. The platelets will usually be low in preeclampsia. If there is low hemoglobin and very low platelets, we should suspect HELP syndrome. HELP syndrome is hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. I have done a separate video on L syndrome. Kindly check it out. Blood urea and serum electrolytes should be done. Urea and creatinine may rise in preeclampsia. Uric acid is a non specific marker of preeclampsia and investigation should be sent for it. 
liver function test should be done alanine and aspartate transaminases rise in free eclampsia if ggt and bilirubin are raised we should again suspect health syndrome albumin falls in preeclampsia because the kidneys lose protein coagulation tests like prothrombin time that is inr and activated partial thromboplastin time aptt are prolonged in severe preeclampsia ultrasound should be done to ensure fetal well being and to assess fetal growth liquor volume and umbilical artery doppler studies should be done now let us see about the management of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy delivery of the baby is the only cure for preeclampsia now let us see about the management of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy the following thing should be done monitoring the disease process monitoring fetal well being treatment of hypertension diagnosis and treatment of complications and appropriate timing of delivery of baby now let us see about each of them in detail now let us see about monitoring of the disease pre eclampsia patients should be admitted because of the risk of fulminating disease or placental abruption blood pressure should be measured every 4 hours urine analysis should be done daily 24 hour protein clearance should be done weekly and twice weekly we have to do complete blood count blood urea and serum electrolytes and liver function tests now let us see about monitoring fetal well being for pre eclampsia patients we have to do fetal ultrasound weekly fetal movements should be observed by the mother and if there are any abnormalities in fetal movements we have to do cardiotocograph to ensure fetal well being now let us see about treatment of hypertension anti hypertensives are indicated when the diastolic blood pressure is repeatedly greater than 100 mm of mercury or if the systolic blood pressure is repeatedly greater than 160 mm of mercury for antenatal patients the first line drug is methyl dopa it is given in the dose of 250 mg thrice daily and it can be increased up to 1 g thrice daily the second line drug is labetalol it is given in the dose of 100 mg twice daily and it can be increased up to 600 mg four times a day another drug which can be used for antenatal management of hypertension is nifedipine it is given in the dose of 10 mg twice daily and it can be increased up to 40 mg twice daily now let us see about the intrapartum management of hypertension severe hypertension developing in labor should be managed with intravenous drugs if the mean arterial pressure is greater than 125 mm of mercury iv idelecin can be given in the dose of 2.5 to 5 mg over 5 minutes and it can be repeated after 15 minutes if the mean arterial pressure is still greater than 125 mm of mercury it can be repeated three times after which IV infusion of idelecin should be started. IV labetalol is given in the dose of 20 mg per hour and its dose is doubled every 30 minutes if the blood pressure is not controlled. The maximum dose is 160 mg per hour. Slow release nifedipine in the dose of 10 mg can also be given for intrapartum management of hypertension. Before giving intravenous idelecin or labetalol colloid bolus should be given to avoid a sudden drop in blood pressure continuous cardiotocograph is required to detect sudden hypotension which can cause acute intraplacental insufficiency remember the target mean arterial pressure is less than 125 mm of mercury now let us see about the postnatal management of hypertension methyl dopa is discontinued after delivery If the hypertension has been moderate or severe, we have to start labetalol or atenolol in the postnatal period. If hypertension antenatally or during labor was mild, we have to stop all antihypertensives and we have to monitor blood pressure for 72 hours. For preeclampsia patients, we have to monitor complete blood count and blood urea, serum electrolytes and liver function tests until they become normal. fluid balance chart should be maintained until diuresis occurs this will usually take 72 hours following delivery we can discharge the patient when the blood pressure is consistently less than 140 by 90 mm of mercury the patient should be advised to have regular bp checkups in nearby hospital and she should be asked to review in 6 weeks to consider discontinuing treatment now let us see about the timing of delivery in preeclampsia 
remember delivery is the only cure for preeclampsia the indications for immediate delivery of fetus are severe hypertension not responsive to double or triple therapy symptomatic preeclampsia with epigastric pain and visual symptoms severe fetal growth restriction with abnormal umbilical artery doppler flow decreasing platelets increasing creatinine alt and ast help syndrome eclampsia and placental abruption ideally the delivery should be delayed until after 37 weeks to allow fetal lung maturity but if indications are there and it requires premature delivery of fetus under 36 weeks we have to give a course of steroids to the mother to aid fetal lung maturity now let us see about the management of severe preeclampsia the criteria for severe preeclampsia is systolic blood pressure greater than 140 mm of mercury or diastolic blood pressure greater than 90 mm of mercury plus proteinuria greater than 0.3 gram per liter that is greater than plus 2 along with symptoms of preeclampsia clonus or grossly abnormal complete blood count or blood urea serum electrolytes and liver function tests the second criteria is systolic blood pressure greater than 170 mm of mercury or diastolic blood pressure greater than 110 mm of mercury plus proteinuria greater than 0.3 gram per liter the third criteria is eclamptic fit if any of these three criteria are present the patient is labeled as severe preeclampsia patient now let us see about the management of severe preeclampsia we should inform our team we should do proper monitoring we should monitor blood pressure mean arterial pressure and pulse rate every 15 minutes we have to monitor oxygen saturation intake output and reflexes every one hour protein area should be assessed complete blood count coagulation profile blood urea serum electrolytes and liver function tests along with urate should be done continuous cardiotocograph is required until delivery fluid balance should be maintained we have to restrict total fluid input to 85 milliliter per hour and we have to insert central venous pressure line if output is less than 100 milliliter in 4 hours and we have to check for pulmonary edema we have to treat hypertension as discussed earlier with IV hydralazine or IV labetalol after giving 500 ml colloid bolus to avoid sudden hypertension if the mean arterial pressure is greater than 125 mm of mercury we have to start anticonvulsant regime Pritchard regime is a commonly used regime in this we give a loading dose of 4 gram magnesium sulfate which is diluted to 20 ml in normal saline this is given slow IV over 5 minutes along with 10 gram magnesium sulfate intramuscularly this is given as 5 gram into each buttock this is the loading dose of magnesium sulfate in Pritchard regime it should be followed by maintenance dose which is 5 gram magnesium sulfate every 4 hours intramuscularly before giving maintenance dose we have to monitor respiratory rate urine output and reflexes the respiratory rate should be greater than 14 per minute the urine output should be greater than 100 milliliter in the previous 4 hours and knee jerk should be present in order to give the next maintenance dose now let us see about the prognosis of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy usually blood pressure returns to normal within six weeks in a few patients there will be hypertension in the long term pregnancy induced hypertension can recur in subsequent pregnancies now let us see about the prevention of preeclampsia aspirin can be given in the antenatal period if there is history of previous severe preeclampsia calcium can be given if there is inadequate dietary supply Vitamin C and vitamin E supplements can be given in the antenatal period to prevent preeclampsia. Now let us see about the complications of preeclampsia. Fetal growth restriction can occur due to uteroplacental insufficiency which can cause impaired fetal growth and reduced liquor volume. Reversed end diastolic flow occurs in the umbilical artery in preeclampsia. Rarely it can lead to intrauterine death. Other complications include HELP syndrome pulmonary edema disseminated intravascular coagulation this occurs due to stimulation of coagulation activity and depletion in clotting factors and platelets in preeclampsia this leads to uncontrolled bleeding 
Other complications of preeclampsia are cerebral hemorrhage. Stroke can occur in uncontrolled hypertension in preeclampsia. It is a major cause of death in preeclamptic women. Placental abruption can occur. It will cause sudden severe abdominal pain with or without vaginal bleeding. It requires urgent delivery of fetus by cesarean section. Eclampsia is a major complication of preeclampsia. It is important to remember that 40% of episodes of eclampsia occur postpartum and it commonly occurs in women not previously diagnosed with preeclampsia. In eclampsia, the seizures are generalized and self-limiting within 2 to 3 minutes. Now let us see about eclampsia in detail. Eclampsia occurs in 1 in 1500 pregnancies. It is a major cause of maternal mortality and morbidity. The patient presents with hypertension with headaches, visual disturbance and seizures. There will be cerebral irritability which will lead to hyperreflexia and clonus. There can be death due to intracerebral hemorrhage. The complications of eclampsia include cerebrovascular injury, pulmonary edema and coagulopathy. Now let us see about the management of eclampsia. Airway, breathing and circulation should be maintained. Anticonvulsant therapy should be given. Pritchard regime of magnesium sulphate can be used. If the seizures are not controlled, diazepam 10 mg intravenous as a bolus can be given. We have to control blood pressure with antihypertensives. We have to prevent pulmonary edema by strict management of fluid input and output. If you have any suggestions, please let me know in the comment section. For more such videos, please check out my playlists. If you like my videos, kindly subscribe. Your subscription will encourage me to make more videos. Thank you.